Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy, and I am the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. And today we're going to be discussing um, neurotoxicity. Now, neurotoxicity is a word we throw around a lot here because it, it has a lot of meaning to us. Um, a lot of what we do to help resurrect people from mental health problems is help people from an environmental medicine level. And um, environmental medicine covers how people are being poisoned and how that affects um, particular physiologies. <clears throat> so there are a lot of things out there that cause mental disturbances because of how they affect the nervous system. So the first question is, what is neurotoxicity? Neurotoxicity is basically when your nervous system is having a toxic effect to either the direct or indirect um, result of chemicals that it's being exposed to. Um, next question, what are some examples of neurotoxicity? Well, a primary um, example is, is a version called excitotoxicity. So there are certain chemicals that will overstimulate the nervous system to the point where you have neuronal death. And in the process, you're overstimulated. Um, this can also, uh, not the, the neurotoxicity can also be meant to mean um, a chemical influence that changes the expression of neurotransmitters. Um, this can be due to drugs. Um, honestly, a lot of drugs actually work by producing a certain neurotoxicity. Um, um, drugs of abuse can cause um, lesions in the brain, like MDMA. Um, that's an example of neurotoxicity. Uh, another example would be organophosphates, pesticides. Um, like basically, how an organophosphate or organocarbamate works <clears throat> is it knocks out the nervous system of the pest. We have, uh, and grasshoppers and such, have a um, chemical called acetylcholine that will cause, let's say, a leg to kick in a grasshopper. And as soon as that leg to kick impulse is initiated, there is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that then pulls acetylcholine off of the synapse, allowing the sodium influx of ions to close so that the leg no longer kicks and there's relaxation. The pesticide poisons that enzyme. It poisons the, um, the acetylcholine esterase enzyme so that that sodium influx stays wide open and basically the insect goes into what's called tetany, which is overexcitement of its muscles, and dies. <clears throat> now, we have livers. You know, we have a better ability to be able to process some of these chemicals than, let's say, grasshoppers. I don't really know if grasshoppers have a liver or not, but we have a bit of a more robust um, detox profile. But that's really dependent on genetics. Some people can process um, chemicals and different chemicals in different ways than others, and we all have a genetic hand. And if we don't have the genetics to be able to break down these type of pesticides, then they can build up in our nervous system and do very similar things. <clears throat> And that would be an example of neurotoxicity. <clears throat> um, next question, is coffee neurotoxic? If you take enough caffeine, it's neurotoxic, <clears throat> but um, modest levels of uh, coffee would not be considered neurotoxic. In fact, um, certain people that tolerate coffee well um, actually Coffee and caffeine can be it can help build new uh, neuronal connections. <clears throat> uh, next question: What foods cause uh, neurotoxins in the body? <clears throat> um, one would be like large fish, like tuna, um, swordfish, shark, um, farm-raised fish, especially farm-raised salmon can impart a neurotoxic load of mercury into our nervous system. <clears throat> Pesticides, which we already discussed. Um, and there's a whole panoply of foods, actually, that have um, you know, a toxic effect on the body. Um, unripe foods like green potatoes, um, unsprouted beans, especially the red kidney beans, unsprouted nuts, 
um, the brown part of the covering for almonds, um, apple or pear or apricot seeds. Um, and generally, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really fascinating almost on a, just a basic observational level, um, what foods we should be eating, what foods we shouldn't. So if a food is not ripe, we shouldn't be eating it because that unripe food is, it actually has protective mechanisms <clears throat> to keep it from being digested by animals or by us until it is viable, until the seeds within it are viable and the fruit is ripe. When it becomes ripe, that breaks down and enzymes are also put into the food that actually assist you in being able to break it down. So this includes nuts and seeds. Like for instance, one of the reasons why you get gas from eating beans is because they're not technically viable for you to eat yet. <clears throat> beans and nuts are meant to be in the ground and resist um, breakdown in the soil even. So they have things that bind minerals and anti-enzymes to keep them viable in the soil or in the environment and not be broken down. Well, that also means our digestion, not being able to break them down. So if you sprout your seeds or you sprout your nuts or uh, even rice, most rice is not capable of being sprouted except for wild rice. Eating sprouted wild rice or sprouted corn, you know, this is a bioavailable food for us. Where if it's not, to some degree, it has a toxic um, implication on our, on our body and our nervous system. <clears throat> uh, next question, what causes neurotoxicity? Um, I'm just going to go through some of the top things. Um, drug therapies. Uh, Drugs of abuse, um, heavy metals, um, particularly mercury and lead, um, certain food and certain food additives. We covered some of the foods, but some of the additives, um, MSG is uh, excitotoxic. Aspartame is also uh, excitotoxic. <coughs> These things are truly neurotoxic um, food additives. <coughs> Insecticides and pesticides, we covered that. Um, uh, this might be a new one for most people, but many cosmetics are very neurotoxic. Um, <clears throat> the more neurotoxic things are generally fat soluble, and the things that you put on your skin uh, are, you know, creams and oils and things, things that will actually go through your skin, which is not a, it's a barrier, your skin's a barrier to like um, polarized compounds like salt water and the water itself but it's not a barrier to, to fat soluble things. So that's why hormone creams can go right into your brain. Well, guess what? Those creams and those solvents act as carriers for a lot of other toxic stuff in your hygiene products to come right into your brain. <clears throat> um, solvents like, you know, huffing or um, <clears throat> hot whippets or um, consumption of alcohol. These things can also be considered neurotoxic. And I'm not talking about a glass of wine. I'm talking about like Everclear and straight alcohol, things that are heavy solvents can be poisonous to your brain, which is neurotoxic. <clears throat> what drugs cause neurotoxicity? <clears throat> well, in the psychiatric um, drugs, most of the drugs, um, the the mechanism of the drug is a neurotoxic effect. So for instance, um, an antidepressant poisons the serotoninase enzyme so that you don't break down serotonin and it stays in the synapse longer, which we believe causes the serotonin to then break down in its metabolites and then you no longer have a lot of serotonin. But the real point is, is that the effect of the drug is to poison an enzyme to produce an effect. Antipsychotics hold back dopamine so that the membrane, that the, the synaptic vesicles that hold dopamine cannot get it out as much. Um, these things are technically, by our definition, neurotoxic. They're poisoning the mechanics of your nervous system in order pr to produce an effect. And by and large, people are poisoned in the first place through food and other sources and lifestyle choices and maybe drugs that has them presenting in a mental health way in the first place. And so 
a lot of the idea behind psychiatry is to try to poison it in another direction and hoping that this broomstick stays standing up straight in the center of a hurricane um, by trying to balance it from two different directions. It, it's um, probably a lot more pragmatic to try to remove the original insults of neurotoxicity and try to find um, behavioral balance there rather than introducing new poisons to try to push it in another direction. It really depends on severity. Sometimes you do need a severe intervention with people. I do recognize that. Um, but that should not come at the expense of going after the other mechanisms and the holistic um, remedies for these sort of things. In, this, in, in the case of using medications, I think it should come in combination with, and then at some point it may be discovered along the way that the medications aren't needed, that the holistic things are enough to, to um, alleviate the, uh, the situation. Um, what drugs are neurotoxic? Um, well, obviously chemotherapy drugs are neurotoxic, um, and which is, you know, in some way, if you're going that route necessary, because you're trying to actually kill off, um, aggressively, um, uh, reproducing cells such as cancer cells, um, organ transplant drugs, maybe as well. Um, nitrous oxide, um, is neurotoxic. And I think the most common neurotoxic drugs are the antipsychotic class. There is actually a phenomenon known as antipsychotic induced dopamine receptor supersensitivity. That basically means that when you've altered the nervous system to the point where you're not getting enough stimulation from dopamine, your body responds by building more dopamine receptors and you become highly dependent on the drug and trying to remove the drug causes um, a drug in, drug drug uh, withdrawal induced psychosis, which um, people mistake oftentimes I think for the, an original diagnosis, and um, people get trapped in those places in ways that um, can um, I think their whole life I don't know how else to say it I mean being on antipsychotics long term when you didn't have to be is quite a cross to bear in the world. Um, <clears throat> What are the symptoms of neurotoxicity? Uh, it depends on what part of the nervous system is getting poisoned. So it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's probably as diverse as any sort of, if you have a, whatever your brain's doing, a neurotoxin can make it not do that. So it could be anything. But in the case of mercury, let's say, uh, the typical presentation is anxiety, um, OCD, and insomnia. In the case of organophosphates, it's also anxiety, but also muscle tension. Um, MSG may also result in anxiety <clears throat> and a loss of memory. Um, you could see people with depression, headaches. Headaches are actually quite common. <clears throat> and behavioral mood problems. Um, <clears throat> next question, can you recover from neurotoxicity? Uh, the prognosis for recovery from neurotoxicity depends on the type of exposure, the length of exposure, and um, the degree, in other words, the concentration of the exposure, and um, the severity of any neurological injury. So if you've had neurotoxicity that has damaged a very vital part of the brain, then the prognosis for that is rather poor. However, in most instances, um, <coughs> removing the source of the neurotoxicity is you can it demonstrates a uh, significant relief now <clears throat> um, people who have developed akesthesia or even mild tardive dyskinesia from taking a medication particularly antipsychotics you lessen or you, or you reduce or you eliminate the antipsychotic a lot of times they do see an alleviation in their symptomatology, but not always. Um, but usually the prognosis for that happening is generally good. Um, but then there are people who, um, you know, once your extra pyramidal symptoms, such as tardive dyskinesia, get to a certain point, it's sort of like the Rubicon. You cross it and it's really hard to come back. Um, <clears throat> Next question is seemingly the same. Is neurotoxicity reversible? Um, as I mentioned, mostly, but not always. And that removing the offending agent is, is 
pretty much the primary um, intervention that's going to be helpful. Um, next question, how do you assess neurotoxicity? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to like, how do we assess it versus how does the greater community assess it? So the greater community, um, the resources that are out there, um, well, how we would, how we would look at it is, uh, a neurotoxic profile usually presents as something that's constant rather than intermittent. Um, especially if it's an accumulated long-term body burden. So if a person's having constant symptomatology, that's a bit different than intermittent. Intermittent generally has other reasons besides neurotoxicity, where if they're presenting with constant symptoms, it's, it's still in your um, range of possibilities in your differential diagnosis. Um, there are some tests that can give you an idea of a neurotoxic burden including those for pesticides, including those for all sorts of chemicals, including the phthalates and your um, bichlorinated uh, biphenyls. There's, there's tests for a lot of these different toxins. Um, one that we use often here is a heavy metal chelation study. Uh, it's called a heavy metal provocation. And just like most other toxic burden um, tests, it does not show you an exact amount of what you have. You can get an exact amount of what's circulating in the blood, but you cannot get an exact amount of what is lodged in the tissues. The best you can do is go with what we do with the chelation study is we give an agent that provokes the release of that from the tissues so that we can get a dump in the urine and get an idea of what their uh, heavy metal burden might be. But it is not... Um, it, the only way you could really get a real number is through... Um, a post-mortem assay of the person's, um, you know, basically breaking down all the molecules and seeing what's there. So you never know that uh, in, of course, one of your living patients. And um, But you can get an idea. It's similar to like if you, let's say you went up to a beehive and you aren't going to dissect the beehive and look and see how many bees are in it, but you kind of want to know if there's bees in there. Well, you go up and you smack the beehive, and if you hear a lot of bees in there, then you know that there's a populated beehive there. If you smack it and you just hear, you know, a couple little buzzings in there, then you think, well, this isn't a really heavy populated beehive. The chelation process is kind of like that. You smack the tissues to give them a release of, of metals, and then you check to see how much comes out. And if you see a lot, then you think the person might have um, be plugged up with heavy metals. Um, there are also some behavioral and psychological tests that can check for... Um, you know, some evidence of neurotoxicity. Um, you could um, do a tissue culture. Um, now, most of the, like, there's neurotoxicity that you could see, brain lesions and more um, larger structure sort of um, decay, but most of the neurotoxic stuff is happening on a real tissue level. So in a tissue culture, you'd have to get in with a microscope and look at um, tissue changes there. <clears throat> There are what's called functional observational testing of the sensory and uh, motor neurological systems. Um, this is what they do for um, tardive dyskinesia. Especially they um, do an observational and kind of provoke certain uh, uh, movements. Um, checking for extrapyramidal symptoms like you'd see in tardive dyskinesia. But um, for neurotoxicity, you may see changes in the motor, which is movement or in sensory, how you feel things. Um, um, you might see changes in learning or memory. Um, they do that a lot in rat studies. They pick a rat, show it a maze, give it a neurotoxin, see how it does in the maze. Um, you know, I, obviously in most cases you don't have a before and after for people that have a neurotoxic burden, but you may see a decline in their uh, ability to learn things in their memory, which might indicate to you to look a little deeper into neurological impairment. Um, there's nerve conduction studies, which will check to see how the nerves are uh, conducting, um, you know, depolarization of the of the of the actual motor neurons. Uh, an EEG can show you some things. Um, uh, neuropathology is seen on an MRI and other lesions found on an MRI. I do not consider myself an expert in these other diagnostic things, but 
when, again, like when, when we're doing a differential diagnosis clinically, uh, without the advantages of having um, some of these other diagnostic tools, uh, one of the things that stands out is neurotoxic people are generally, um, presenting with constant symptomatology. It's not something that comes and goes. It's something that's with them and is persistent. Uh, how do we treat neurotoxicity? Um, first, you eliminate the source, if you know what it is, of the neurotoxic insult. Um, a broad sweep of getting all the neurotoxic stuff out of your environment is another way to go about it, um, which is technically a good thing for all of us to do. Um, some of these things might be foods, you know, if you're eating foods laden with neurotoxic pesticide goo, then, um, get rid of that. Eat organic, you know? I mean, I know it costs a little bit more, but I mean, what are you really doing? You're, you're, it, it it's like you watch the people spraying pesticides. They're not just out there, you know, hanging out, like having a kombucha spraying, you know, these the vegetables they're in hazmat suits there's a reason for that you know something that is going to kill an insect um it's not something you really think you should be eating i mean obviously some of these insecticides work on physiology of insects in a way that it doesn't work on us but you're still talking about stuff that's not necessary to put on your food it's just not um getting the mercury fillings out um I think that having mercury fillings is an anathema and it's an embarrassment to the American Dental Association. The fact that they haven't taken ownership that putting the most toxic natural occurring substance that's specifically neurotoxic and neurodegenerative in your head is retarded. Um, again, is, is, is retarded of the profession itself. And, um, I'm embarrassed, honestly, that medicine, um, oftentimes operates in these ways. Um, the mercury filling, thing uh it wasn't based on like oh you know mercury's you know they didn't they didn't even think about like mercury being toxic they the 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 the, the rationale behind using amalgam fillings with mercury in it was because they're very easily manipulatable you can push them into places you can form them they tend to last they have good durability in the body but they're also bleaching out again in 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 two parts per million exposed to a nerve cell will disintegrate that nerve cell within minutes. Having this stuff in your head is, 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 it's an anathema. Um, so again, how do we treat neurotoxicity? Um, the, by and large, the, the, unless it's metal poisons, um, heavy metals, the main poisons are going to be, um, fat soluble, because the water soluble things, you just, if basically if they don't kill you on the first go around, you've expressed them out of your body and they're gone. Um, things that build up in your system are fat soluble. They will bond to tissues and hold on to tissues and wait for, in order to get those out, you have to biotransform them. There are natural biotransformative um, chemicals in the body that will metabolize out these things and convert them into a water soluble form. Some people have better genetics for that than others. And there's all sorts of different sort of pathways that deal with different types of poisons, everything from caffeine, alcohol, marijuana, um, organophosphates, you know, dot, 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 are in people's genetic hand is to being able to metabolize each one of those things safely. Um, but there are some basic mechanics around it and we amplify that biotransformative process to help, um, mobilize these things, uh, more expeditiously to help people with their mental health symptoms. Um, we also used either nebulized or IV glutathione, which is a very potent antioxidant that actually gets across cell membranes and gets into places to help <coughs> detox even on an intracellular level, excuse me, an intercellular level, which means it can um, do things like protect your DNA and such. Um, another infusion we use is called NAD as in Nancy Adam Dennis, NAD. And this is a very potent um, part of your energy metabolism that basically gets the mitochondria in your cells working um, at a higher rate so that you can uh, clean out your cells. Um, <clears throat> and um, it helps clean up oxidative stressors and such. 
And then we flood the body with a lot of neuroprotective uh, phospholipids, fish oils, and other antioxidants that help protect the brain. And phospholipids actually help build cell, mains, cell membranes. And your brain is largely fat. Um, your nervous system has fatty coverings on much of its nerves. And those phospholipids can help be protective in that way. All right, last question. <clears throat> How to protect your brain from neurotoxicity? One of the best ways is to eat organic foods, as we talked about before, and um, restrict any of the known uh, neurotoxicants. Um, I've seen people really messed up from uh, MSG, um, having chronic migraine headaches and neurotoxicity. They're getting overstimulated by the glutamate. Um, too much glutamate is definitely neurotoxic, and in certain sensitive people, um, it has larger ramifications. Aspartame is another one that is, you know, it's a food additive, but it's also a neurotoxin. And there's, I mean, people drinking diet sodas, honestly, the aspartame is poisoning, probably poisoning their energy metabolism to the point where they're going to gain weight anyway. If you like drinking carbonated sodas, they have sodas that are sweetened with Zevia that are both going to not pack on the weight and not have a neurotoxic ramification. <laughs> Um, smoking is another way. Smoking, uh, because the tobacco is a broadleaf plant, I mean, oxidizing and inhaling something anyway is, uh, has <clears throat> health effects. But then a broadleaf um, plant is collecting everything from the environment that's landing on the leaf, and you're also oxidizing and smoking that too, including things like plutonium and other stuff that's just kind of floating around out there. Um, eating a lot of good fats. Um, the having an ounce or so of cod liver oil, um, you know, is is uh, just swig it right out of the bottle. If it's got lemon flavored in it, it's usually um, doesn't taste so bad. And um, another suggestion might be for you to turn off your TV and go outside and get some air. And with that, I'm going to bid you adieu. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a good day or evening.